hello students so we have been seeing uh, the simple linear regression and uh, in our last uh, session we have come across the uh, equations to calculate the mean square error and to get an optimal straight line we have got to update our uh, weights and biases using minimum least square uh, mean squared error is what we got to know. So, I like to continue this topic further ahead and we are going to talk about optimization method today based upon what all we have discussed in our previous class. So, this is a continuity. So, optimization method what exactly is it is we have like uh, as seen from our last class we need to find out the optimal parameters which is nothing but optimal amount of weights in biases so that the input and the output meet a linear relationship that we have been calling as y i equal to w x i plus b that is a linear relationship and we require to fit in proper um, proper value of weight and biases so you get a best fit line. Okay. So, now if at all it is a single neuron, uh, single input neuron model, then only two samples are suffice to obtain the exact solution for this equation. You could use elimination method and get an optimal solution out of it. Uh, so, you this exact solution that I have been discussing is derived by a strict formula which we call it as an analytical solution, but that is the case when you have got a single input neuron. So, practically it is not possible. So, uh, we do have the cases where you have multiple data points you know multiple neurons are available then what are we going to do. So, in that case you have to only go for an optimizational method optimization method numerical optimization method approach is only the best approach to get an approximate numerical solution. Now, why do we call it as an optimization? This is because we know that the computer's calculation speed is very fast and we can use this computing power which is very powerful of the computer in order to search and try multiple uh, values which are present multiple number of times thereby reducing the error L the equation that we just got to know from our previous class we want to reduce that value of mean square error L value that is how we kept their argument. Yeah, you remember. So, uh, you want to reduce, you want to minimize the value of L step by step, thus the process is called as an optimization process. So, if you really want to approach an optimization method, then you have to follow certain step by step procedures for it and therefore, we now dive into optimization algorithm. The very first of its kind is brute force algorithm. So, this is the simplest optimization method which is also known as a random experiment. So, what are we going to do in brute force algorithm? It is very, very simple. All you are going to do is to find out the most suitable uh, w star and b star that is the parameters that you would like to update weights and biases and you can randomly sample any any value for w and b from real number space and then you calculate the value of l using those w and b. So, you just fit in the values of uh, different samples of uh, w and b those values you are going to fit into the equation of l and then you are going to find out which value of w and b gives you the least value for l which is your mean square error. So, you pick out the smallest l star from all the experiments conducted on l and then the value where you got minimum value of l those values of w and b are your optimal values of w star and b star and they are called as optimal parameters and that is what we are looking for. So, the advantages of this brute force algorithm it is very simple very straight forward from real number sample space you are picking up the values of w and b and you are trying to calculate l for all these values out of it you are going to sort for minimum value of l the minimum value of l for what values of w and b you got you are going to call them as optimal parameters w star and b star as simple as that. So, now the advantage is it is very simple and it is straightforward. but then I know what is the disadvantage you know it will be very very inefficient if you have a high amount of data high dimension of the data because obviously you are doing calculating w and b for all the values and then significantly trying for uh, getting a least value of l 
and then taking optimal parameters out of it, it is quite a long process although it is too simple. So, the disadvantage it is very it is extremely inefficient when you have got large scale high dimensional optimization problem. So, this was the very first kind of optimization algorithm that you have dealt with now. It is called brute force algorithm and we have seen the advantages and disadvantages. Now, let us dive into the important aspect of an optimization process which is gradient descent algorithm that is what I can call as a backbone algorithm for deep learning alright. So, now the gradient descent algorithm is the most commonly used algor uh, optimization algorithm in neural network training. Parallel acceleration capability of powerful graphic processing unit GPU chips and it is very suitable for optimizing neural network models with massive data. So, here it is overcoming the problem that was there with brute force algorithm ok. Even though the data is massive it is going to work. It is also suitable for optimizing even the simplest model like the simple R simple linear neuron model that we just discussed even you can apply the same gradient descent algorithm in this case. It is a core algorithm for deep learning as I just said. Now the concept of derivative I dive into. The concept of derivative can be used to solve maximum and minimum value of a function. So, our aim is to minimize the loss here. So, I really want to minimize the loss function. For that I have to consider always the derivative of that mathematical function ok. So, you all know you are all aware with your maths how to find out maxima and minima may to find out minima that is the case here minimum of error function. So, to calculate minima we always approach for uh, to calculate maxima or minima in that case you always approach for derivative of that function so that it gives you variation of that function with respect to some parameter. So, we know the stagnation point can be found by setting the derivative to 0, the stagnation type can also be checked thereafter. So, for a better overview let me consider it with an example. So, you focus here on the diagram ok. So, consider a mathematical function f of x x square sin x. So, when you can see this blue line over this figure it is nothing but your mathematical function if I plot it. Now, suppose I want to find out the maxima or minima of this particular mathematical function x square sin x. I am supposed to plot its derivative now. So, these orange dash lines that you are focusing now onto the figure they are the, uh, the, the orange dotted line stands for the derivative of this particular function. We have taken here for ease of access the uh, range from minus 10 to 10. So, you can see here these are uh, solid line blue line is the function and the dotted line orange line is the derivative. So, what do you analyze from this figure is the points where these derivative line that is the dashed line is crossing the 0 these points are called as the stagnation point. So, you could see here this point and this point they are stagnation point. I will just plot it properly for you. So, this particular point one second yeah. So, this particular point and these crossovers you know these are all for an example the crossovers where it is crossing 0 they are all your stagnation points. Now, uh, the gradient of uh, if I want to talk about now the concept of gradient using this derivative the gradient of a function is defined as a vector of partial derivatives of the function on each independent variable. Now, what do you understand by that is suppose you got a mathematical function f of x comma y. So, with that I understand that this particular mathematical this particular mathematical function is dependent on two variables x and y. Alright. So, this function is dependent on x and y, x and y both are independent variables correct. Now, gradient of a function is defined as a vector. So, the moment I am calling vector because it is more than one uh, values and when I call it a vector it not only has got a value a magnitude but also it will have a direction to it ok. So, now this gradient of a vector uh, gradient of a function is a vector which is nothing but a vector of partial derivatives of this function on each independent variable. So, one independent variable here is x the second being y. So, I call this particular function as z for ease of axis. So, now dou z by dou x is the partial derivative of this function 
with respect to the first independent variable x dou z by dou y is partial derivative of this function z with respect to second independent variable y. So, when I combine these two and form a vector then what I am getting here is a gradient. So, I represent gradient of that function as nabla of f and I put that into square brackets and I write dou z by dou x comma dou z by dou y is nothing but my vector. So, this is vector I am representing as nabla of f is now what I call it as a gradient of my function. To put it more proper let us take an example in place of f suppose f value is cos square of x cos square of y. So, this function f is dependent on two independent variables x and y which if you plot a three dimensional figure the function and its gradient looks like this. So, what do you observe here are all these arrow marks I want you to focus on. So, this length of the red arrow marks you can see they are varying somewhere around in the middle they are long and then they are becoming short. So, this length of the red arrow in the plane represents the value the modulus uh, absolute value of your gradient vector and the direction of the arrow represents the direction of the gradient vector. Since I told gradient vector is a vector it has got both it has got both value magnitude as well as a direction. So, the arrow marks the direction of the arrow marks shows the direction of gradient vector and the length of the arrow gives you the magnitude of that particular gradient vector. So, now I observe from this figure that the direction of the arrow always points to the direction where the function value is increasing. The steeper the function surface the longer will be the length of an arrow which you can clearly observe by seeing the picture and uh, the longer the arrow means the larger the modulus of the gradient, the larger is the absolute value of your gradient. Now, if you really want to understand how it goes and calculates its value, you can see how the transition is going. So, it is calculated till it reaches its minimum value here in this particular figure that you can see. Now, concept of gradient descent if I want to present then Right now with the given example that I just discussed we have observed the gradient direction of a function always points to the direction in which the function value increases. So, now suppose if you want to calculate gradient for a loss function you really do not want to go into the direction where the function value increases you do not want loss to be more. So, you will go in the direction where your loss function is decreasing that is why we will choose an opposite direction for this gradient where the function value decreases that is why we write it as x hash x star x x dash is equal to x minus eta nabla f. So, in place of adding it up to the gradient you will subtract so that you are going into the negative direction and this mod this particular equation gets updated using x minus eta nabla f unless and until you get a smaller and a smaller function value of that function value is nothing but the loss function value. Now, this is the function x dash x dash that you are calculating uh, the parameter here for your loss function you want to update it every time and you are updating it from its previous value by subtracting the gradient and also you could see there is one more uh, term here. So, what is it? It is eta which we call it as a learning rate. So, you can see eta is influencing your gradient vector. So, it is nothing but a scale fact scaling factor of your gradient vector and it is always a small value always set to around 0 0.01 or 0 0.001. You learn more on this when you will learn about back propagation algorithm, but for now you please understand that this is uh, the mathematical equation by which we try to update our parameters using gradient descent. So, I would, so I would say that for one dimensional vector if I really want to go for then I would say the updated parameter using gradient descent optimization approach would be x dash is equal to x minus eta dy by dx. Here I am assuming there is only one uh, independent variable so I can write it, but if there are more than one then you have to better represent in this way and this is nothing but a vector of how this particular uh, function is dependent on more than one variable. 
okay so this was about gradient descent all you have to remember that every single time a parameter is best chosen in gradient descent based upon how the loss function is diminishing with it okay so you want to go in gradient descent direction that's why you are updating it with a minus and how fast or how slow will be controlled by this scaling factor here which is we calling here as learning rate or eta and then this is your gradient vector so using gradient vector you can find out the best possible updated parameter that could give you an optimized result to your um, uh, that could give you an optimized parameter list I can say that could give you the minimized loss function. So this was about gradient descent next we are going to study about more in gradient descent algorithm and various types also in our next session. Thank you.